Uh, let me just sort of say that the second order material generalizes in natural ways. So previously we've looked at, you know, second order homogeneous linear differential equations with constant coefficients. And we talked about what to do if there are real roots. I mean, roots, we talked about how there's, there is a corresponding quadratic equation. And you use the roots of the quadratic equation to solve the second order linear homogeneous differential equation. Um, all of this generalizes, I'm going to be repeating myself, but generalizes pretty naturally. If, if instead of a second order differential equation, we have a third order differential equation or a fourth order differential equation. So for a second order, differential equation, we needed two solutions to put together and create the general solution. For a third order linear homogeneous differential equation with constant coefficients, uh, get very sick of saying that by the end of this class, but we, for a third order one, we need three solutions in general. We need as many solutions as the order of the equation. And we get solutions the same way. We look at polynomials and we find the roots of polynomials and we use them to create solutions. I mean, really the only thing that makes it harder for higher order differential equations is that you know that root finding by hand is not easy or oh, possible really for like higher order polynomials. So you might have to use a computer or something to assist you. But like say we have the third derivative of y plus three times the second derivative of y times 10 times the first derivative of y equals zero. And let's even, now let's leave off the initial values for now. So the polynomial corresponding to this, x cubed plus three x squared, minus 10x equals zero. And I mean, I cheated a little by selecting an easy to work with uh, differential equation that x pulls out and you get x squared plus three x minus 10 equals zero, and then you always know a classroom exercise by 
how well stuff factors, but uh, x squared plus 3x minus 10, we can just factor that, and we get three real roots from this. We get lambda equals zero, negative five, positive two. And when you have real roots, it works exactly how it did in the second order case. We're going to get solutions E to the zero X, E to the negative five X, E to the two X. And once we have these solutions, we can use the superposition principle to combine them and get the general solution. Um, e to the zero x, incidentally, is just one. So we get the constant from that. So aside from the fact that, you know, maybe it's harder to find the, uh, find the roots, this worked exactly the same as in the second order case. And similarly, what if we have, say, the third derivative of y, plus the first derivative of y minus n y equals zero. Well, the corresponding um, characteristic equation is x cubed plus x minus 10 equals zero. And offhand, I have no idea what these roots are. So, I mean, I talked about using computer assistance. Let's just go to wolframalpha.com and see if this can help me. X cubed plus X minus 10 equals zero. So we have now complex roots. We have a real root who is our root, and then we have negative one plus or minus two i. Well, the complex roots in this third order case are going to work just the same as the complex roots in the second order case, which a few students kind of forgot how to work with that on the test. This is something you really should know, but first of all, this real number two is going to give us a root. It's, going to give us a solution, I mean, e to the 2x. And as for the imaginary, or the complex, I should say, roots, we're going to get e to the real part. So e to the negative first times x 
And then the cosine, let's see. We don't need a C1 out here because we're going to have constant C1 and C2 in here. So we're going to have the cosine of the imaginary part times x plus the sine of the imaginary part times x uh, plus a constant. And I'm getting a little careless. We've already used C1 in front of e to the 2x. So we can't use it again. C2 times the cosine of 2x plus C3 times the sine of 2x. So real solutions, complex solutions, it's all the same. Assuming that you have the correct number of roots. So for this third order thing, we needed three roots. Then everything from the previous section just goes through without a hitch. And there's nothing really to be said. Um, it's when you have repeated roots that things require a bit more common. And let's go on what's going to seem like some weird detour, but is actually relevant <laughs> to what we're talking about. And let's briefly define an operator. So an operator is simply a function of functions. So for example, differentiation is a rule that takes an input and assigns it to a unique output. That's what a function is. It's a rule that takes an input and assigns it to a unique output. So differentiation is an operator. It takes a function as an input, gives a function as the output. However, we don't Quite use function notation for operators. Um, we don't have that F in parentheses like we're used to. We just have the name of the operator in front of the function. And as you might guess, differentiation is probably the well, I was going to say the main operator we're going to use in this course. We're not going to do a lot of operator theory, um, but this is an operator. So you can take D and you can apply it to the sine of X plus three. Now, now I have to use parentheses. If I didn't have parentheses, it wouldn't be obvious if the D is just attached to the sign or if it's just, or if it's attached to the whole thing. And this is just a way of saying that we're taking the derivative of this. We can, Define operators like B squared in the natural way. Um, B squared means we're taking the derivative of the derivative of Y meaning that we're taking the second derivative of y. 
and we can define what we call polynomial operators, things like d squared plus 2d minus 1. This is an operator. You can take it and you can apply it to a function y. And it works very much like multiplication. I mean, it's the second, it's d squared y plus 2dy minus y. So the second derivative of y plus twice the first derivative of y minus y. And the implication of that is that you can take these, um, these linear homogeneous differential equations we've been looking at, and you can think of them in terms of operators. Like say we have the third derivative of y minus two y prime plus y equals zero. We could define an operator Call it L D cubed minus two D plus one. And this differential equation written in terms of that operator is Ly equals zero. So because, I mean, let's, uh, let's expand on that a little. Ly is this applied to Y. So the third derivative of Y minus twice the derivative of y plus one y. So this here is Ly, and we're setting it equal to zero. So this is Ly equals zero. And now I'm going to, sorry, I need to keep getting notifications, but I think that's done. Um, I'm going now to state a theorem. I'm not going to prove it. There is a proof somewhere in my notes, but these, Operator polynomials lots of quotation marks here factor like real polynomial. So let's say we have L equals, let me just do this, uh, trying to get an easy to factor polynomial d squared minus 2d, d squared minus d minus 2. So say that L 
We're defining L just like we did on the previous frame. Say that L is that. And say that we have another operator, L2, which is a D minus two times D plus one. Well, if D were a variable, like if instead of D we had X, then these two would clearly be the same. I mean, maybe theory is pushing it, but this second thing is just what you get if you factor this first thing. Well, we don't have variables though. We have this differential operator. It's not, at least to me, it's not inherently obvious that you should be able to take a differential operator and factor it as if we had a polynomial. But what I'm saying is that you can. What I've called L and L2 really are the same. If you take them both and you apply them both to a function, you're going to get the same output. Let's take this and let's use it as a tool to try to investigate repeated roots. So let's say that you've got, you're trying to solve a differential equation and you've got the characteristic equation a sub n x to the n plus a sub n minus one, x to the n minus one, and so on down the line. And again, we can think if this is our characteristic equation, then our original differential equation was a sub n, the nth derivative of y, plus a sub n minus one, the n minus first derivative of y, and so on. Yeah, sorry running out of space, but so on down the line. And we could think of this as Ly equals zero, just as we did in the previous frame. If we define L to be A sub N, D to the power of N, plus a sub n minus one, d to the power of n minus one. If we define L like this, then this differential equation is L y equals zero. So this is the situation we are, we've got. This is, this is the differential equation we're actually trying to solve. This is the same differential equation rewritten in terms of this operator L. 
And we are approaching this differential equation by um, taking the characteristic equation and trying to solve it. All good so far. Then, according to the fundamental theorem of algebra, this characteristic equation factors. Um, it might have complex roots. It might factor over the complex plane. It might have really ugly roots that there is no way to actually find them. And we have to just use a calculator to approximate them. But in theory, this polynomial can be a factor. as x minus the first root times x minus the second root. Again, some of these roots might be complex. Some of them might be really ugly. But this polynomial that we're looking at factors like this. Now, the case we're looking at, we've looked at the case, if all of these roots are different, then we're golden. It doesn't matter if they're real, it doesn't matter if they're complex, as long as they're different, so that we have n linearly independent solutions, we're good to go. But it could be that when we factor this thing, some of these R's are repeated. And when we factor our characteristic polynomial, we get something that looks like to this. And now we are no longer gold because we do not have n distinct roots. And the question we are now going to address is well, how do we how do we deal with the fact that we have this repeated factor? And what we're going to use here is this statement that these polynomial operators, I don't know why I said operator polynomial, the polynomial comes first. Anyway, these polynomial operators factor just like real polynomials. So here we have this real polynomial, and we have this polynomial operator, and the coefficients are the same, and the powers are the same. So this up here and this down here are going to factor in the same way. Yeah. B minus R1, D minus R2, and so on. until we get to d minus r to the power of k. And we're setting ly equal to zero. So if we hit y with this, we ought to get to zero. And now we are going to investigate 
to this. And um, we're going to use associativity here. So this is, this looks like multiplication. It isn't multiplication, it's composition. This is an operator, it's a function. It's being applied to this operator, which is a function. This function is <laughs> being applied to this function. This function is being applied to this function down the line. That's another reason, by the way, that this is really not obvious because I mean, composition doesn't usually work like this, but here it does. So the thing about composition is that it's associative. We can put in parentheses wherever we want. I'm going to put in some parentheses there. So that D minus R to the power of K is outside of the parentheses. <laughs> now, what's the point of this? Well, suppose this. is zero. D minus R sub I applied to zero. Is the derivative of zero minus R sub I times zero it's zero, right? So say we have D minus R one times D minus R two times D minus R three, all applied to zero. Now, again, using associativity, D minus R3 applied to zero. Is zero. Using associativity again. D minus R2 applied to zero is zero. And then we've got D minus R1 applied to zero, and that's zero. So if this D minus R to the kth power power in scare quotes, because this is really repeated composition. But if D minus R to the kth power were zero, then this equality would be satisfied. So, our goal here, is to make D minus R to the case power applied to Y equal to zero. And now we're going to do something very similar to what we did, I mean, it was a while ago now with the test and everything. But um, last time we sort of were confronted with something like this, we said, well, we know 
that e to the r x is a solution. And we know that constants find solutions are solutions. Maybe there's a non-zero constant, U of a uh, what? A non-constant function, U of x, such that U of x times e to the rx is a solution. I mean, this is sort of the logic we used when we saw repeated roots in the second order case. And it's not lovely to look at, but if you take U of X e to the R X and you hit it with D minus R to the power of K, then after the dust figures, you actually get quite a simple expression. The case derivative of U equals zero. And if we think of functions that turn to zero when we take their derivative, there's only one class of functions that do that, and it's the polynomial functions. Like if you take the <laughs> second derivative of a linear function, or the third derivative of a quadratic, or the fourth derivative of a quintic, then those are zero. So, there are values of U that satisfy this, like X. And depending on what K is, we go up to K minus one. So each of these values of U gives us a linearly independent solution. If we had as our characteristic polynomial, x minus one times x plus two times x minus three to the fourth. Then from x minus one, we get e to the x. From x plus two, we get e to the negative x. Um, from x minus three, we get e to the three x, x e to the three x, x squared, e to the three x, x cubed, e to the three x. And now this power three is one less than that power four. So we are done. And we have gotten, this was fourth degree, I mean, this was sixth degree, four plus one plus one is six. So we needed six linearly independent solutions. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six, exactly what we needed. So that's repeated roots. And that's also, this section. Does, uh, does anybody have any questions about what we just did? Yes. So would you write all those into like y equals c1 times e to the x? Would you write in that general solution? Yeah, yeah the okay. general solution here. C, c1. 
C1 e to the x plus C2 plus C3 plus C4 plus C5 plus C6. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm.